Shani? Yeah, it's live now. Yeah, now it's live, I think. Yeah, so still uh, just a minute. Okay. And you do this every week, Anil? Yes, every Thursday. So the first one we had with GV Prasad, who's the. So they will be asking questions. So, so you live so, on uh, so, YouTube? So, Ishani? Yeah, now. yeah, now it's live, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah. so it's still. There is feedback coming from YouTube, so obviously we need to. Okay. All right, Ishani, shall we start? Yes, sir. Okay. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this time and to this space. It's uh, wonderful to have everybody, and I think as we can see, participants are coming into the webinar room, into the Zoom room. So, for the benefit of everybody, uh, we started a couple of weeks back, and the first Thursday we had uh, G.B. Prasad, uh, the co-chair of the board of Dr. Reddy's, and you know, Prasad had this fascinating conversation with us about who he is. And it was really very, very inspiring to learn from how Dr. Reddy is creating the well being of all. And then we had TV Narendran, the global managing director and CEO for Tata Steel, and, you know, the Tata group being very special. So we had a fascinating conversation with Narendran. And I am very pleased personally that today we have William Bissell. I haven't met William as much as I would have liked to, but the few occasions I have met him, I have been immediately struck by the humanity in him, the compassion in him, and the way he thinks in such a holistic way. He's one of the only business leaders I know who always has concern to serve the well-being of all. I remember when he came to Soil a few years back to speak to our students and also gave us a copy of his book. I was almost stunned by what he told me. He said, you know, the tribal population in this country, we owe a lot to them because they really look after our ecological well-being. And in fact, we should be paying the tribal for what they do to serve Mother Nature and the way they protect the indigenous forms and the plants and the animals and so on and so forth. And I was quite stunned by what he said. And, you know, I really remember that as a fascinating conversation Then I read his book. And I think he's the first business leader I know who said, let's involve the supply chain. So if there are weavers making the handlooms, which are making the product for Fab India, we should not just make them partners. We should literally make them shareholders. And that's something that is very, very rare in today's business world. So, William, what a joy to have you. And therefore, the first question I'd like to really ask you, William, is out of all the wonderful things you have done, I know your father started Fab India and began by exporting. And then you went for your education overseas and you came back. And then you started getting involved. And then you took one challenge after the other and you kept on manifesting transformation on Prab India from one part to the other part. So in this uh, wonderful journey you've had, William, when do you remember something that you did which really gave you the maximum happiness and you and your organization were at their personal best? What stands out in your memory? as examples of the best of Fab India and where you were also the happiest. Thanks, Anil. Uh, it's nice to be uh, back in touch with you. Um, I've always been a great admirer of what you've accomplished at Soil. I've watched it grow um, from its early days when I first met you. And it's been really amazing to meet the students of Soil in different parts of life. Um, you know, I think uh, some of the most fulfilling um, moments in one's life have to do with giving back. Um, I think that, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I set up the Fab India School, and that was a, a very affirming thing for me. I mean, people said, oh, you're making a big sacrifice. I said, no, I'm doing it because I love it. I mean, I'm really doing what I want to be doing. And the school was very exciting to set up at that time. And uh, it was something I was passionate about. 
I um, spent some time working with a wonderful organization called the Center for Science and Environment, working on something called the Citizens Report on the State of India's Environment. I found that to be incredibly fulfilling work. Um, I think the work we did on the community-owned companies um, was very fulfilling. It was very, um, it, it made you go to sleep every day thinking you've really done something worthwhile. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of learnings that came out of that process of community-owned companies and how they could be a force for transformation. Uh, it was exciting, but very exciting times. And, uh, you know, being involved with people who are making a change is very exciting. I mean, being involved with you in a small way is exciting. You know, there, there are many change makers now. And, you know, seeing the work they do is, is just, it's very affirming to what's important to be done and, you know, interestingly, we, are, we find ourselves now in a crossroads in society around the world where people are really rethinking a lot of things. You know, as uh, I, I remember that famous quote from Lenin, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. And Lenin made this quote, which, and he said it at some point, and, and really we're going through one of those times, weeks when decades happen. I mean, when I look back, when we talk about pre-COVID, it's interesting, you know, it, it feels like it was years ago when it was actually just weeks ago. And, uh, you know, one of the very fulfilling things we're doing right now as a company is, you know, we've, we've turned our production, part of our production over to making uh, the suits, coveralls for healthcare workers. And it's been a really amazing process. And uh, the partnerships that we formed, we, you know, we, we, we took it upon ourselves to produce them from components made in India. And that was a real challenge because uh, many manufacturers, including a couple of fantastic companies, retool their production lines to make the fabrics, the tapes, everything. So it was really an exciting time. So it's doing things like that, I think, that are deeply fulfilling. As, uh, as the Ikigai principles, I'm always reminded of those circles. You must have seen them, the Japanese concept. You know, what you're good at, what you love to do, what makes a change in the world, what pays you some money and you know and, and when you find the center of those circles you're really in a place of harmony how wonderful i mean that was always the image i had in my heart when i looked at you and your work now disc please describe to us in this journey of fab india where you were an exporter and then you began to at some point you decided you need to focus on the consumer in the country and then you had all these challenges on the supply chain and you had to really make sure that uh, the people who were part of the supply chain were treated as equals. So could you describe some of these key moments in the company and what made you think like that and what made you come out with those answers to serve the whole system rather than just look at being just another big company? You know, I, I, I've always felt that um, companies last for a long time when they have a purpose, when they exist for a purpose. And uh, having just the bottom line as your purpose is not a very good purpose to have for a long time mission. So if you are doing something other than that, and that is you know, a byproduct of what you do, then I think you have a much greater chance of you know, having a long life as a company as opposed to just saying, you know, I'm here for the bottom line. And so if, if you have a purpose and something that a passion and, you know, as Simon Sinek's famous video goes, you know, you have a why there, um, why you exist, what your purpose is. Then I think you've given yourself a way of being relevant, especially if your purpose is, is relevant and important for society. And I think that that's, you know, uh, when we were an export company uh, in the late 90s, the decision to become a retailer was a decision that a lot of people in those days said was something that was not a good idea to become an Indian brand. They would, if you wanted to become a brand, they said, you know, you, you need to look at what other brands are doing and copy them. So basically you became a copy of the Gap or you became a copy of X, Y, and Z brand. Those brands were not coming into India at the time. So you basically, but the decision to become a brand that celebrated India was a decision I think a group of us took collectively. And it was a very good decision for the business because 
there was a rise of the middle class uh, and the econo period of economic liberalization. And uh, people wanted a brand that you know, spoke to them and spoke to their desire to, to connect with their culture and their traditions. And, and that's what it did. And, you know, and now when I look back, that was 20 years ago. And interestingly enough, we're going through a period now where most businesses are going to have to reinvent themselves to survive. Not all, but most businesses. And, and again, we're at that moment of inf that point of inflection. You know, it, we were at a point of inflection in the 90s when I could see that the future for a company like ours that didn't actually manufacture but traded was not going to, we were not going to have a good future because with the advent of faxes and emails and everything and international trade fairs, you know, it, it was getting easier and easier for the buyer, the ultimate buyer in the West to get in touch with the manufacturer. We didn't really have a role. To play. So rather than, you know, see a decline, we stepped out at the peak of our business. We literally stepped out when we were at the peak of our business. We'd had the best year and we stepped out and we reinvented ourselves. And, you know, I think, you know, we are going through a period where I, I call it a period of the three R's, where this period is a period to reflect, reset, reimagine, and then ultimately to reinvent yourself. So we're going through a similar period. I don't think we will come out of this as the kind of retail business we were when we went into it. I mean, I think that we will be a very different kind of business and a different way. And, and, you know, and hopefully we will change in a way that, that is, that is exciting to our customers and to society at large. And, you know, I would like to go into a deeper conversation about that. But before we turn to that, I mean, something which really tickled my imagination. How did you manage to make your viewers, your shareholders? Was there not opposition to that idea? Were people in the board or the other shareholders, what were they saying? And how did you include the simple weavers to understand the concept of becoming like co-owners. I mean, how was that done at that time? So um, we started this project of community-owned companies in, um, in around 2006. And uh, the idea was that we would create the last mile of our supply chain. We would co-invest with our artisans and create the last mile of the supply chain and create something called a community-owned company. And the initial vision was originally those community-owned companies would become shareholders of Fab India. The beginning of the vision went very well. Uh, it was much harder than we thought. I mean, it was not easy to do for many of the reasons that you uh, pointed out. But then uh, after about nine years, we actually, we had at that point 17 community-owned companies. Um, and to give you an interesting statistic, the uh, largest of those uh, was valued at the shares were roughly 11 times um, what people had originally invested at. And the smallest, the, the least successful of the community owned companies, the shares had just, just over doubled in a period of seven years, which isn't great, but the, but you know, there were 17 companies. And, and interestingly enough, we realized that beyond a point, we couldn't continue to grow them without having to list the companies. And then it got too complicated because we had reached a critical mass. And then if you wanted to actually grow in terms of the number of shareholders, the law of the land is that you need to list. And they were all public limited companies. And it was interesting. So we took the decision that we couldn't, it, that complexity was more than our ability to manage. And it was going to distract us from operating the main business. So what we did was we um, made an open offer to all the shareholders and we bought them out. And you know, that was to me personally a huge disappointment because I wanted to see it to its logical conclusion. We'd gotten, you know, 70% of the way there. And what heartbreaking in a way was that we couldn't go the balance 30%. But I think in the process, we created a very interesting model. Uh, we still have two community owned companies. One of them is uh, based in uh, Bikaner and the other one's based in Bhubaneswar. Um, and they, they continue to do well. I mean, they have each has a uh, couple of thousand shareholders and uh, they're extremely well managed by, by their teams. But, but the ultimate dream, the last bit I couldn't do. And that was, that remains 
a bit of a disappointment. And what did you learn out of this whole experience about yourself and about the whole aspect of what was your vision, what actually happened, and what did you learn out of that? I think the biggest learning one had was that um, you know the, the way uh, uh, countries have to decide on their priority and and build policy to suit their priorities. So, for example. If, as com most countries in the world, they tax tobacco companies and alcohol companies at a much higher rate because they produce goods that are not deemed to be socially, you know, important. Uh, similarly, I think company countries need to look at the impact that companies have on society, community, on environment, and work out policies that favor those companies that have those impacts. And you know, just like you do with alcohol and tobacco, you tax the, the the companies that generate a lot of negative externalities, as economists call them. But the interesting thing for me was that if you're going to set up a community of companies, you're going to do something, you're going to have stakeholders, and you're going to work in areas which are all classified as backward districts where there is very low un very, very high unemployment, then the policy environment should also support those companies. And this is something that I think when, you know, we have, hopefully in the future, this will be something that governments will take as a priority. Yeah, I completely agree with you because I think the intangibles of a company, which really define the social capital. Yes. You know, that is uh, such a profound thing or, or the, the well-being of the environment. I mean, these are such wonderful things. Now tell me out of all the things you have done, including these experience centers you have created recently and the growth you have had in opening more stores, also going international in select markets and so on and so forth. In all this journey, what have you discovered about yourself as a leader? What are your, What is the kind of talent that you think you have and the strengths which you have, which have been given to you? You know, the things that you, which come naturally to you. I know it's difficult to talk about one's own strengths like that, but still, out of all the experience that you have had, what emerges as, as a strength that you truly value about yourself? I mean, I think that the attributes for leadership are common. I mean, I, I don't think there's, I, I think the ability to listen, uh, especially when you don't, and to understand that you actually don't know a lot when you go into a situation. I think that's a very common attitude. I think that it's one that I try to cultivate. I don't know how successful I am, uh, but you try to listen and you try to understand what is happening because reality is an ever-changing thing. You know, when you look out at what's happening in the world, it is constantly evolving, changing. And, you know, if, if you are not listening, then, um, you know, I don't think you're evolving as a leader. I'll give you a small example of it. You know, the, the, as you mentioned, the experience centers. What happened was that I was sitting in, I was in a store one day and I, I was talking to a customer and they said, you know, frankly, it's such a hassle now to go shopping. You have to leave your place, you have to get in your car, you can't find parking, there's tons of traffic and all. And they said, you know, the internet is so amazing. We can just order what we want sitting at home. And, you know, it's air conditioned and it's quiet and we don't need to do it. I realized that, Listening to that customer, I realized they were, they were conveying a very fundamental truth. But unless we did something with the model, why would a customer want to walk into a rectangular box, which is a store, with stuff on rails and pull something out when you have all the hassles of time, parking, traffic? And this happened in Bangalore, where the traffic is particularly difficult. So, you know, there, there is really a sacrifice to go out unless you really have to. So when I heard that, I said, you know, if we want to survive as a retail business, you're going to have to give customers an experience that they can't get on the net. And otherwise, we should be on the net. And we did. We do have a net presence. But, but So the idea of the experience center came about. And till the virus hit, until, of course, the lockdown began, it was a very successful concept in that we integrated a cafe, a wellness center, a children's learning and discovery center called Tugbug. Um, you know, we, we had a home design studio. So we had all these, an alteration studio where you could get, you know, you didn't like the sleeve length of your kurta, you could get it altered, you could get it. 
So the idea was to create something which you could, an experience you couldn't get on the net. And it proved to be very successful. I mean, the experience centers, we started with one pilot, we rolled out 27. And I think in the future, they will be successful. But I think in the next two years, it's going to be a period of, you know, I, I don't think we're going to come out of this situation as quickly and social interactions are going to be the same, given the fear of the virus. So how do you as a, as a business just look at reinventing yourself for this period? The experience centers are, I mean, human have basic needs. They have to communicate with each other, to meet each other, to be in public spaces. These are basic needs from the time we existed. So these needs are not going to go away. But, you know, you're going to have to bring them together in, in a way that is different, especially in this two-year period. Like, one of the nicest things I saw in an experience at Arnold was I saw uh, a grandparent. It's a grandfather obviously had no, he was there with his grand, grandkids, no, experience, no interest in shopping. So he went to the cafe, was sitting, reading the paper, having a cup of coffee, looking very pleased. Grandmother was shopping and the kids were in the tub bar. And that was, to me, really something that was a synthesis of, of a lot of what we wanted to do with the experience center. It was very exciting. Yeah. Wonderful, William. Now let's turn to this conversation that, uh, of course, has this uh, huge uh, impact, what's happening right now on this COVID crisis. And in some ways, the people who say that, you know, this was coming to us in some form. I mean, we have not taken responsibility for the way we live now, the way the planet was going in one direction and not taking responsibility. And some people say this is something, something of this kind was to happen. But now that it has happened and everybody says life is not going to be the same again. What do you think? is the new emerging world? What are the early signals you are picking up? And what do you think organizations and leaders need to pay close attention to in what you are observing that is emerging? So what, what do you think is your own understanding of what is coming? I think in three words, my understanding is humanity is one. I mean, this is an event which is shared globally. Every person in every country is experiencing pretty much the same thing. Over a billion kids are out of school around the world. Families are experiencing the same thing. I think this is an event where we begin to see that actually we live on a very small planet. Humanity is one. We can call ourselves different you know, nations, different religions, different but I think that the idea that humanity is one and that we face common challenges and, and we can best solve those challenges by coming together rather than breaking apart. I mean, that's the main lesson that I carry from this. And so at an organizational level, for instance, in Fab India, what are some of the things that you are thinking of? Because everybody nowadays is concerned about uh, managing cash, trying to you know, struggle to pay all the stakeholders on time and, of course, the most important, the employees. And so there are all kinds of these issues and organizations, even large ones, are struggling in the present circumstances. So how are you visualizing this and how are you leading this, this process during these difficult days in Fab India itself? You know, I, um, my job is uh, to think about where we're going to be a couple of years from now. Um, fortunately, I am not running Fab India day to day anymore because it's run by an incredibly competent team headed by my colleague, the managing director. And I think they are doing everything necessary, both in Fab India and in our sister company, Organic India, to manage you know, this, this current situation and all the practical things of conserving cash, managing all of that, I think the playbook for that is, is very clear and you have to have a lot of discipline. I'm focusing on right now, where are we going to be two, three years from now? Because this is a game-changing event. And uh, you know, I'm interested to see where, where the business will be, where consumers will be, you know, where societies are going to be and, and you know, how we're going to reinvent ourselves for the consumer of the post-COVID situation. 
Uh, Anil, just just seeing, I'm seeing some questions come up on the chat. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, and I know, and okay. in about a couple of minutes, we will switch we over to switch that. Over. So, okay. Yeah, we will be switching over to that format. Okay. And be before we do that, I wanted to ask you a particular question that is very critical right now. On one hand, you have to pay attention to the future, and you have to be very calm and pay complete attention to looking at the future and really sourcing inspiration and creativity from within yourself to contribute to the future. On the other hand, there is this pressure of today, which is putting all kinds of fear. Will we survive? Will I survive? Will my family survive? Will my job survive? Will my organization survive? So there is this strange combination of fear and the need for creativity and imagination. And this paradox, managing both is such an important part of uh, who a leader is. How is that emerging in your own heart and mind and the people who are with you? You know, I, it was interesting. I, um, I went to a, a workshop two months ago, uh, in February uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, which is something called Lead Like Gandhi, uh, run by a, a wonderful man in his uh, partner who's built an amazing practice of helping leaders think in ways that are very holistic, you know, see an ecosystem rather than just a, a piece of something. And, you know, one of the things I learned from the Lead Like Gandhi workshops and, and the way it's being conducted is that, that um, in times like this, you have to sort of step back and look at, look at where you're heading, your industry, your particular situation is heading. Now, like, for example, imagine if I was running a cruise line. I mean, that's a business model that is now seriously at risk after all the bad publicity. So the question is, how do you reinvent yourself? And a friend of mine was saying, <laughs> amazing, he said, you know, cruise ships should become floating universities. Now. You know, and I just thought, wow, and somebody as gave a suggestion, they should become floating hospital. You know, I mean, they were interesting suggestions. So as a leader, you need to just expose yourself, like film being exposed to all kinds of influences and not restrict yourself to an industry because when you see the business model is going to profoundly change and there's no doubt about that. And so what do you do in a, in a situation like that? You continue to do the same old playbook. So there are a lot of businesses I know that are waiting for post-COVID and then they'll do the same thing they were doing pre-COVID, but they, they, they're going to end up I hope, but I hope not, but I think many of them will end up failing as businesses because they will just go back doing, they're looking at this as an interruption, a brief interruption, and then they go back to doing what they're doing, but that's not gonna work. So you have to really understand what is it that you're gonna offer when you come out of this situation and how are you gonna make that offering and what, what is the nature of the business gonna look like? And so I think every industry is gonna have to go through that churn. And that's very uncomfortable for most people because they've been used to doing things in a particular way. And then you have to flip the playbook. I still have people coming and saying, okay, what is your next quarter's projection? And the quarter after that. I'm like, you know, honestly, if you want me to make up a number, I'll make it up. But frankly, I don't know what next week's projection is going to be, you know? So, I mean, it, it's a difficult situation. So I think one thing that leaders need to be is really at this point, Ignore a lot of your baggage and learnings and experience and, and put it aside and just try to think about something, think with a fresh mind. Wonderful. My last question before we take the questions from the audience, the last question is, what is your personal practice for your own well-being? How do you remain focused on your own well-being so that you can serve the well-being of others? What's your personal practice for that? Well, you know, I, um, it's interesting. I, I learned this from someone who'd been in prison for a very long time, Nelson Mandela. And he said, you know, he, he told an interview once, I think that, that, look, my days were all the same. So basically I needed to create a structure around my day. And he said the importance of just creating a structure and following that every single day. I think that I learned that lesson and I, and I think structure for me is, you know, a couple of hours in the morning of, you know, exercising and then 
action work, which is actually you know participating in what is going on, and then to make to take a couple of hours every day to do some deep reflection, and especially at this time, this is for any leader, this is critical. Even if it means filling your waste paper basket up with you know blank pieces of paper that you scribbled on, just sit and reflect on on what this, and teach yourself and go on internet sites and see what's happening and listen to interviews that you never listened to otherwise. Just educate yourself, expose yourself, and then. I think it's spending time nurturing and nurturing people around you. I think it's very important. A lot of people, I try to call up one or two friends who are alone at this period every day, different friend, and just chat with them for a while, find out how they are. I think these kind of simple activities, if you can pull them into your day, it really helps sustain you for a period like this. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, William. That's uh, what a treat to talk to you. And there are now several questions. So let me start with the first one. Uh, Nishita is asking, as Fab India is creating a base for skilled, sustainable uh, rural employment, and it's the platform for products that are made from traditional techniques, skills, and hand bays, you must be interacting with people a lot from rural India. How do you feel about that? And she says she's curious because she also wants to work to, sometime in the rural areas and wants to learn as to how that experience is as compared to all the interaction with the people, folks from the cities. It's interesting. I there has been much from the communities that I've been in touch with, and it's just a small cross section. I find there's much less distress in rural India than there is in parts of urban India, where people are, you know, where people have left their villages or their small towns and come to the city and uh, place of work. Those people are actually in a in a far more vulnerable situation than the people in rural areas because they're in their families. And there is a way that India has always looked after its people. You know, the rural communities have actually, you know, they, they, you're near the soil, you grow what you need in many communities. You manage, even if there isn't much income coming in. And then, thanks to the government's efforts with the, you know, Manrega and the extension of work, I find that there's less distress than I thought in rural areas, which is a very good sign. Thank you. Yuvraj Srivastav, who is the chief of human resources of Make My Trip. Wow. He asked this question. Has there been any shift in the financial status of the craftsmen? And how do you measure it to say how their quality of life, etc., has changed by their association with Fab India? So one way to measure it is anecdotally. Like I've been working with some, I mean, I was talking to somebody recently who I remember he had a one room place and he, he did some printing on, on the ground on a tuck. I mean, he has a very large unit now and, you know, he, he does well and he's worked incredibly hard and done, you know, really well for him and his family and his sons have joined him. So, you know, you have lots of success stories like that. I was looking at a town called Maheshwar where I've been for many, many years and seeing how many of the weavers now I think it's 16 or 17 of them have their own units and have prospered greatly. So it's it's been really nice when you go to communities like that over a 20-year period, like Chanderi is another place in Madhya Pradesh, Maheshwar is in Madhya Pradesh. I look at other places that we've been working for a long time. You do see a change, but the greatest change you see is where the master craftsmen had some entrepreneurial skills. Those are the people who've really been able to do well. And and you know they have thrived because in the beginning there was just us buying their product. Now they have many buyers, and I think that diversity of buyers and access to market has helped them in a way. The people who haven't done so well are the other weavers who never became master craftsmen or I mean never became entrepreneurs. Sorry, not master craftsmen. They've had a different, more tougher time because you have to be quite savvy to survive in the market, and you know, and and so even the micro entrepreneurs have done very well. So our focus is really encouraging micro-entrepreneurship because those are the people that work in the most remote areas, provide the jobs, build the businesses. And uh, Sneha Yadav, another uh, you know, person in the, in the webinar is asking as a founder, you must be experiencing a tremendous amount of pressure in this current situation. So how do you manage to retain your sanity amongst all this? Because as a founder, sometimes 
you feel more responsible for the business than the professional management who's running the organization. I, I think the sadness, the, there is sadness that comes from the fact that if this situation continues for a few more months, then there might be some layoffs. And that is a very sad thought because that is, for me personally, the last thing one would want to do. And, you know, if you have to make a choice between the long-term uh, future of the business and laying people off, that's a horrible situation to be in. And to me, that is the major this is a situation that causes the major amount of anxiety and stress. Because one is constantly trying to see how long, you know, and, and if, you know, if the economic recovery doesn't happen or it's very, it's very delayed, it will cause immense uh, damage because it won't affect just one business, but a lot of businesses. So I'm hoping that we are not in a prolonged uh, depression uh, after this. Um, and, you know, one will try to do everything one can to, to figure out where the avenues for growth are going to be post this and to sustain the business in that period. I mean, and that's going to be the real challenge. That challenge is not stressful. I mean, one has to just think about it. What's hard is the fact that at some point, if, if things don't get better, they will be pain and hardship. Uh, and that's something, you know, as a co-founder myself, I, that's the only thing that bothers me myself as uh, someone who's founded uh, the school of ours. And, you know, so I completely agree with what you're, what you're talking about. But that is the worst thing that a founder with a social conscience would like to do is to have that very difficult conversation about, about that element. Now, Nupur Todi, who's um, a, a colleague and who now works with uh, Pricewaterhouse, Coop or PwC, she, she says you partner and work with multiple external stakeholders. And how did you cultivate a sense of community amongst your leaders and the ecosystem thinking in the culture compared to the individual excellence that many people strive for. See, so many, many companies have this idea of acquisition and incorporation. I believe in, I'm a great believer in diversity and I'm a great believer that from that diversity comes what you know, the, the writer uh, Nicholas Talib says is anti-fragility. So uh, I noticed that Nupur made a comment about Dugbug and, and the interesting thing is that the idea was to partner with people who have great ideas and, uh, and wonderful abilities. And the founder of Tabak, Sharika Munshi, she, has, she had a fantastic passion for what she was doing. And we recognize that passion. Our idea is to support the diversity. I mean, you don't want to say, okay, let's make it part of Fab India so um, you won't support the diversity. Because diversity exists when you can you know, have another concept and nourish that and encourage that it doesn't detract from you. It, in fact, adds to what you're doing. Um, you know, we are one of our, our partner organizations is Organic India, which has done fantastic work. But it is a very distinct and separate company from Fab India. Even though it shares, the, our value systems are very similar, but its founders and, and their vision and dream. The idea is to sustain that. Because in sustaining diversity, you, you build a very different construct in a, in a set of businesses. So the idea of the Experience Center was um, to support other businesses that shared a similar value system and some similar goals and allow them to flourish in diversity rather than try to make everything part of one you know, a division of something. Now, Jessica Singh, who is this uh, wonderful colleague who lives in Toronto, and she says something, she's paying a compliment. She's a fan of Fab India. So she says, the experience centers are wonderful, the delectable food from the cafe. I wish I could get that experience here in Canada. It uh, most certainly would get a great response. And, uh, you know, have you ever thought of doing something like in places like Canada and Toronto, for instance? Well, we're tempted by Canada because it's such a wonderful Indian city. Yeah. Toronto, Montreal, there you you know you see them becoming such centers of you know I mean there's such a vibrant Indian 
diaspora in these cities. And it's really exciting to see that. And hopefully, you know, if we find the right partners, it'll be great. Oh, how I don't know nice. if the weather would suit Fab India's clothing, but I mean, that's a separate. Yes. Uh, so Jessica, any idea of entrepreneurship? So <laughs> anyway, uh, you are probably very busy with your poetry and writing and so on. So Arvind Kumar wants to ask uh, a question. He said, reality is ever changing and we need to keep reinventing. So how are you enabling your top team and yourself to reinvent yourself to handle these kinds of transformational sort of times? Well, I think the wonderful thing about Arvind's question is it has the answer in the question, which is that as long as you can keep your feet to the ground in terms of reality, reality will tell you what's happening. Like when I heard that customer in Bangalore, I realized that that customer was showing me a picture of reality. This was a reality that they were experiencing and I needed to be in the moment listening to them. And out of that thought came the idea of the experience center. So I think if you, Arvind's question is great because if you focus on reality and you try to clean your mind of all the preconceptions that you have and all the projectioning you're doing, then you really get to see reality. You get to hear from people, you get to see reality. And if you don't, then you, know, you risk missing the bus yeah. because the bus will leave and you'll still be looking somewhere else. Now, Subramaniam Sundram asked this question that your analysis on creating an experience to get customers to retail shops was really great. In the last five years, you see many more Indian clothing sort of brands which are penetrating and coming up. So how are you learning from your competition and how are you preparing Fab India to be a winner in this environment where there is more and more competition? You know, I think I think that if you look at what others are doing, yes, uh, and you you can you get a sense of where they are. I mean, they really help you a lot. Yes. They, they they do your job for you by by giving you good ideas and yes. giving you inspiration for different things. I mean, I think in the last fifteen years we've seen the rise of some fantastic brands. I mean, yes, you look at Maniver, which is a great brand built entirely from scratch. Yes, it, uh, I mean a brand like um, what Anita Dongre and her family have created uh, yes. with Global Desi. And, yes. um, has your electricity gone? Yes, and it'll come back in a minute. I am in uh, DLF, the Saralias in Gurkaon, but I'm sure it'll come back in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it looks, you look wonderful, all framed with, uh, anyway, you're back now. But, <laughs> so I, I yeah. think that they, they I, like, I love to see what people are doing. Like, Recently, there's a, a wonderful brand called uh, Nico, Nico Bar. Yes. Uh, I really love the, the concept that they had with the kind of clothing and the way they represented casual clothing and how they, you know, so I find it exciting. And, and yes. as long as you're creative and you're thinking up ideas, you, you don't have a problem. It's when you stop being creative and thinking of ideas that you start to worry about the competition. Yes. There's a very interesting question from a very interesting man, Sunil Sabara, who does these significant work as an entrepreneur. Now he leads these transformation workshops and which are very unusual workshops. Uh, he's also a dear friend of uh, my close friend called Nipun Mehta, who's the founder of Service Space, the world's largest volunteer network. I don't know if you are with yeah. 500,000 members. You may have heard of Nipun. Yes. So Sunil Sabara, Says, William, do you believe that the universe has sent us COVID to really think hard on why are we here and how we should collectively raise the consciousness of the world? So I, it's funny that uh, Sunil is on, on had sent a question because uh, I was uh, a little while ago talking about the work that he's done with Lead Like Gandhi and, and how I was influenced by the time I spent in Ahmedabad that his last workshop. So I think that that's a hard question to answer. There are a lot of people who feel that this is a message for humanity. Yes. It is. I mean, it's time that we started recognizing that, you know, that we have one human future. The planet is getting increasingly smaller and we need to work together. I think that lesson is being made in many ways. And 
Yeah. And I think that we ignore those lessons that are peril. I mean, if we continue to pollute the earth, we continue to ignore um, biohazards like in, in the case of infectious diseases like this virus, we continue to not look at solutions. And if we work together, I mean, it's going to be to our great disadvantage. I mean, and, and this is more, even more true with environmental damage, because as environmental damage accumulates and as as yeah. global institutions are too weak to take the lead, we will all suffer. It won't be one people of one country suffering, it will be people in every country suffering in different ways. Yes. So I think and you know, on the, right. yeah. yes. on the YouTube channel where there are about 300 people with you right now, and uh, I'm so delighted that many of them are from your stores and many of them are your colleagues also who are greeting you and wishing you and I think Obviously, people seem to love working with you, so they are also expressing that in the YouTube channel. But here is a question from Shobit Kumar. Which paths you will suggest to one who's working on the ground and looking up to one day head a company like Fab India? What path would you suggest to the person? What should a person do if he's at the grassroots level and aspires one day to be right at the top? So my advice for right now would be to keep your job because I think that this is not a time. This is not a good time to be striking out on your own. I think uh, like everything, this too shall pass. And when it passes, I think it's important to you know, train yourself. Uh, I think there's going to be a huge need for people who understand new technologies. I was in a meeting uh, and I was struck with 10 people and I was struck that all the contributions were just coming from two people out of the 10 because they understood the new technologies. The other eight were talking in generalities because they, they basically didn't understand the direction the technologies were taking in the direction of change. I think the, the thing is pick up, use this time. Don't take a risk at this time. As an entrepreneur, I shouldn't be saying this, but I am. I think that this is a dangerous time to take a risk. I think this is a time to educate yourself and learn something really well. Learn about the new technologies, uh, learn about what your passion is and what you really care about deeply. Because if you're going to do something, it should be along the lines of what you're passionate about, not where, like I get a lot of entrepreneurs who say, this is a place I can really make good money and I'll get rounds of investors. I was like, that's not a good business model. I mean, is that what you're really passionate about? They're like, yeah, I says, I'm really passionate, but I'm going to raise X amount of money. I'm like, no, no. Is your passion about just raising the money or actually what you're doing? So I think it's important to, to think deeply about these things. I mean, what is it that you're really passionate about? And then learn the skills around it. Thank you. Uh, Sanjay Chaudhary, who's, uh, I think, a management consultant who now works back with industry into, into in financial services and capital, the Tata Capital, for example, so Sanjay asks the question, how do you look back on your association with private equity? Did this help you achieve your objective? Uh, so I have uh, a lot of experience with private equity. I would say that done right, private equity is an amazing tool. I mean, it is an amazing because it allows uh, entrepreneurs to leverage themselves in a way that it's very hard to do when banks are being conservative and banks have to be conservative because um, they can, they usually lend when the business model has already been proven, but before the business model is proven, that's where venture capital and private equity play a key role because they come in there. My only, my only wish is that at some point, I hope that company law changes to be able to allow uh, entrepreneurs to have different classes of shares because basically capital especially venture capital and private equity capital helps an entrepreneur leverage their ideas. If their ideas are good, they should be able to get much more leveraging and things like differential voting right shares help them get that leverage. Animesh, uh, who is from your Kolkata store, he says he is a Fab India employee from Kolkata and he says you are the best boss that you have ever had. And he has a huge amount of respect for you. 
So well, he, should, he should be given a raise immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But you know, you you really are loved by by your people, and that is uh, no surprise to me, William. So now let's turn to another question here. On uh, those were the questions from YouTube, and I'm now turning back to the webinar. And you, uh, Prakash, is asking a question that you talked about listening. And Sorry? understanding, and you talked about listening earlier. You know the listening, and could you talk a little bit more about it? And that also brings me to our uh, dear common friend Arun Myra. Arun Myra wanted me to specially ask you a question: that in this time, when you are listening to different voices in your industry, especially the voices of people who are the weakest sections of society associated with your industry. What are you learning about the weakest people when you listen to their voices? And how is that impacting the whole industry? And how do you think the government and the entire ecosystem is responding to what's going on in your industry, which is so crucial, but it also has huge implication for the weakest in the chain? Uh, that's a lot of questions. Let me start with the listening part of it. Um, yes. um, the thing is that all answers exist. I believe that every answer to every question is out there. It requires just listening to, to understand where and picking out from what you hear a course of action. So I think that if you, if you pay attention to people's needs, you, they, they do communicate them to you. And then if you figure out that this is, this is what people really want, then you can shift your thinking and that of the business to meet those needs. That's why listening is so important, especially for people who are in leadership roles, listening to people within the company, listening to people. Um, you know, the, the thing is that we're all quite powerless right now. I mean, we have, for example, a couple of thousand vendors across the country. They all have the same problem right now. They're all starved of funds. We ourselves are starved of funds because there's no revenue coming in right now. And the thing is that in these situations, you look to government to help because you know it's like you go to a hospital when you can no longer look after yourself or your family can no longer look after you. And, and in these situations, it's hard for policymakers because they themselves are stuck in a situation where there are hundreds of demands upon government. Every industry, I, I read every industry has got its own set of demands and, and they're going to the government, they're knocking on their door and saying, we need this, and we need this. So it's very hard for government. So in a situation like this, I think that uh, it's important for people to come together and try to see how, what are the solutions that will work? And I think there are solutions out there. I mean, there are solutions that don't involve government doling out money to industry, but there are solutions by which industry can come can come back on its feet without a handout. It's not they're not easy solutions, but they can be constructed. There are policies that exist. Um, there are some new types of corporate forms of ownership and leveraging and funding that are out there that if we were to make some minor changes in policy, we could bring those in and they would help um, bring foreign investment in or various kinds of investment in. It's a subject for another much longer discussion, but there are those forms exist. Right now, the people who are, our endeavor is to keep ourselves alive and continue to, even if we're working at a very low level right now, continue to keep the business, keep the funding cycle going, um, use our capital wisely, help our suppliers in their times of needs. But it, it is a lot of it is dependent on how soon one can come back to business. Because if, if business is postponed, if, if you're basically in a coma for three months, the return will become that much harder. Himang Kapoor, who is one of the new students who has just enrolled in soil is asking, you wanted to become an environmentalist in your early days, but you ended up then pursuing the textile business. Have you ever thought that you should do something more directly for contributing to 
you know, the environmental well-being part? Have you ever thought that you should directly do that? You are, of course, contributing to that even in your own way right now. No, I mean, I, it, the decision to join the company full-time was taken when my father fell ill. And it happened very suddenly. He was fine one day and the next day he was very ill. So that was a decision taken. Um, and I felt I had, that was my responsibility. So it was something I felt I needed to do. Um, I thought after a few years, I'd probably go back to doing what I was doing. Uh, but then I got involved with the company and life took over and I wasn't able to go back. But I do feel that um, at some point it would be an important contribution to make because I think that our, our small planet is, is in grave danger. Um, and I think it's beginning to affect our health. I mean, you know, one of the sad things is to see you know, two icons of, of cinema pass away one after the other in two different day before yesterday and yesterday to see, you know, and both at a very young age of cancer. And I think this is an indication, uh, the coronavirus. I mean, I know so many young friends who have cancer. You know, I mean, when I lived in a village in Rajasthan, people didn't die of childhood diseases. They usually made it to quite a ripe old age. But now you see all these young people who have chronic diseases. And I think that part of that is our lifestyle, but part of that is also the damage we're causing the environment. And um, you know, one of the things I've, I've often thought about is that if we were not causing the environment so much damage, I think we'd all be healthier as people as well. So it's affecting, because we live in this, on this little planet. When you pollute the planet, you pollute yourself. You two are the same. Rajan Makhijani, whom I know, who met you recently, and uh, we talked about uh, Rajan. He's asking a question, crisis also means opportunity. And what are the opportunities that you see in the current crisis? I'm still looking, Rajan. I haven't seen the opportunity yet. I mean, that, that flash of light, that Eureka moment hasn't hit. I mean, it's a, this is a really tough one. It's a really, really tough crisis. I know that there's some opportunity in here, but it's a very tough time. Okay. And to say anything else would not be telling the truth. I mean, I think it's... it's, it's a, this is a once in a maybe two century event. Yeah. And so William, uh, what would you like to say as your parting thoughts before I sum up to all, especially a lot of young people who are listening to you right now and who want to learn from a leader like you, what would you like to share with them, with all the young people who are listening to you? Do what you love to do and the rest will take care of itself. How wonderful. And so it is really, again, going back to Ikekai that you, that you began with in talking to us about. And, uh, and here is a mindfulness teacher, Raki Sharma, who uh, talks about you being very connected to villagers, artisans, weavers, and tribals. And there is so much to learn from you, she, she says. And, and is, it, is there any way you could collect, you could connect urban children and to connect to the lives of people in the villages and could there be an opportunity? I know you run a school of an unusual kind, but could the urban children get the benefit of learning from their rural counterparts and could Fab India in some way enable that? Wow, that's a great thought. Uh, it, re it requires some thinking about. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it. I think it's a great idea. It's an idea that many people should adopt because it will give people in urban areas a sense of what's happening in the rest of the country. I think the three most important years of my life were the years that I lived in a small village in Rajasthan. I learned a lot. Um, I don't have any answers to that, but, but it's definitely something I'm going to think about. Wonderful. So, William, here are the things I learned from you today, just to be with you this evening. One, you say it straight from the heart. There is no trying to think about what answer to give. It comes straight from the source. Two, you genuinely care for the people, not just the ones who work with you, but the people who work along with you in the entire ecosystem. And you genuinely seem to care about the well-being of the planet. 
and you know you were at your most energized best when you were making this point about really contributing to the whole you are also being very candid you don't pretend to have all the answers because and i completely agree with you you see chairmen of board ceos of companies sometimes we put too much trust in them and the fact is they are as much clueless as the rest of us in fact the thing i heard and which really speaks highly of you is about the leader as a social architect which is convene the right people around the right questions and then get out of their way you symbolize that with many of the answers you gave today you were also very honest to admit the pain i mean it must have taken a lot of courage for you to say that even in a such a socially conscious company like fab india if this situation continues for a few months then there is no alternative because you don't have cash where will you get that from so there is something you are saying it so explicitly and you know and 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 the thing that really touched me was the fact that you are very pained that if at all it ever comes to the question of things like asking some people to go you are really troubled by that and that's something that really bothers you you also are urging the entire system to take responsibility to say there are some very innovative forms out there that there could be ways in which the government and industry and society could reinvent itself rather than just allowing companies to get into difficulties and you are urging all of us to take responsibility to think in that way uh, what a remarkable evening uh, today what a fresh sort of piece of energy for everybody and everybody watching out there just love what you do and if you still don't know what that is ask yourself what you are really good at who are the people who matter to you what are their needs you are inspired to serve and how can you leverage what you are good at to serve the needs of people who matter to you so thank you very much uh, for being part of this soil digital channel this evening i can't thank you enough william thank well i'm honored much. i'm honored to be here with you anil because i and it because i'm i I've, i've always been a, a distant admirer of the fantastic work you've done and thank you for doing it every day thank you very much thank you thank you very much